Good morning, everybody. Hope you are doing well. Welcome to our new project, the, what are we calling it? The Not Typical Podcast or Not, not Typical the, uh, Book Club? Not Your Typical Book Club. So I like that name. Cool. Yeah. Let's roll with it. So um, Chris and I and Rami, uh, we've been uh, hosting a book club here in Ottawa for a few months now. Years. And, Let's say years. Yeah. Involved in book Pretend. clubs for a few years, <laughs> but... Um, we figured that since we're doing this already, let's just film it and throw it out there. It doesn't uh, take us more time to uh, produce the content. So if you guys want to tune in, we'll be posting these on YouTube on a weekly basis. And the idea here is to read um, about a book a month and share what we learned from the book. Uh, if you guys want to follow along, uh, we're reading at about a 40 to 60 page uh, speed per week. And uh, yeah, you're welcome to tune in and, and uh, listen to what we have to say. So I'll introduce my, uh, my partners here. To the far left, we have Christian Charon, uh, a local realtor here, really good friend. Um, we the best, the best of friends. The best of friends. <laughs> and uh, local realtor here in, in Ottawa. And we have Rami El Biano. Is that, yeah, is that correct? Just say it naturally. No, fuck. Well, no. <laughs> you Teach wrote us how it was and for all so we can get that out of the way. El Biano. El Biano. Easy. 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 That's, that's Rami El Biano. <laughs> a local uh, mortgage broker that we've been dealing with for many years. One of the best in the industry. Um, a Cowboys fan. Yeah, that's true. And you know what? A book lover. That's... <laughs> He's like, shut up, guys. Let's get it. <laughs> and, and a book lover. I love... Uh, books have changed my life, so that's... Um, the first open house I we did together, that. you we uh, started talking about the books we were reading, and I was pretending like I knew what you were talking about because I had just started book clubs, so it was yeah. all new to me. So it's yeah. nice to go full circle, and here we are today. I can't remember that talking about we were books talking again. About. I'm not sure uh, it was. Napoleon Hill is the one we were talking about. Okay. So, so yeah. bef before we get started on uh, this week's content, maybe we can touch on. What was the first book that we read that we remember that really influenced our, our direction in life? So I think that's an interesting topic. Sure. Um, Chris, you want the to The first book I bought and read was How to Get Rich by the one and only The Don, The Donald. And it was a terrible book, horrible <laughs> book. But I read it, yeah. and it got me into, you know, uh, the mood of, of reading more books. So that's the first book I bought. Uh, Donald Trump had, had just started uh, his show. What's it called? The Apprentice. The Apprentice. And I thought that was the coolest show ever. So I bought his book. Yeah, it, it wasn't a good book. It doesn't tell you how to get rich. It tells you, you know, how, how, how rich he is. Yeah. You yeah. know, but still, it had uh, good stories of, of, you know, when he purchased the uh, Trump Tower and stuff like that. So still pretty interesting. But I wouldn't recommend it. But it, it's a... That was my first book. He also has the other one, The Art of Negotiation, is it? Apparently that's yeah, good. I've never yeah. heard. Apparently his, his entire political campaign um, is based on the strategies that he talks about in that book. I mean, the guy is where he is today by doing what he yeah. always talked about doing. I mean, it's got to mean something, right? Uh, my favorite, my, well, it's not my favorite book by all means, but it's uh, my first book I ever read is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. I had to pull it up here because I forgot the author's name, but it's uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Just say it naturally. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Easier said than done, eh? So um, when this came out, I remember people riding the bus reading this book. There were people yeah. in airports everywhere. People had the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. And you had it too, right? Yeah, it's funny uh, you should mention that book because... That was the one I was going to bring up also. I remember being um, sort of, because my, my parents are, are well off, but they're not rich. Right. And I, I remember hiding the book from my dad just because I was like getting advice from Robert, which was sort of like the rich dad figure. But like, yeah, I read it when I was about 17. Oh, and wow. it really launched my, you know, interest in finances and interest in mm -hmm. owning assets and, and stuff like that. So was this the first of its kind, according to you guys, or? I think Napoleon Hill. Because I started reading this book, but I was also 17, 18 when you told me to read it, and it just didn't click with me. I was working in construction, I had my, you know, uh, 
I, I wasn't too sure where I was going in life. Right. This book didn't re resonate with me at that at the time. That so resonates with you now. Uh, I would have to read it again, I oh, guess. Okay. But yeah. I think it was unique for its day because it was yeah. like the first business book to be written. Well, maybe not the first, but first popular business book to be written as a story. Right. You know, and it's entertaining. Yeah. And so. He keeps comparing the rich dad and the poor dad. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how he had the poor dad and he was looking up to his friend's dad. Yeah. Or the right. person he was working for. Yeah. Something like that. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So let's get into this week's content. Uh, so we are uh, reading for this month, The Purple Cow by Seth Godin. Um, so it's the second book by Seth that we read, uh, that we're reading this year. First one was The Dip. Yeah. And um, yeah, very uh, good author. We love his stuff. And um, let's talk about what is a purple cow, gentlemen. How to stand out. Okay. Mm -hmm. In a field of black and white or brown cows. Yeah. So I like how he starts off with a little story, right? Um, this ties into the last book we read, actually, telling the story, how important it is. Um, you know, he's driving around in Paris, I think it was, mm -hmm. and at first these fields of cows are like nice to look at. It's like he's in an awe state, and it's like super, you know, beautiful to look at. But then it gets boring because it's more of the same, you know, same scenery over and over again. So that's how. The book starts, yeah. and he says, if one cow was purple, that would stand out, and that would be amazing to look at, um, but it would also get old pretty quick. If they were all purple. If they were all purple. Yeah. yeah. If it was common yeah. to see. Yeah. It's like when the iPhone first came out. It wasn't the first smartphone. I think it, the first smartphone was the Palm Pilot. I had a yeah. Palm Pilot. Yeah. The yeah. Palm Pilot, that was a purple cow, because it revolutionized phones, Yeah. and then you started seeing more and more phones coming out that were smartphones. And so then what was the purple cow aspect of the iPhone? The if simplicity, I think, right? The simplicity and the, the sleekness of it, I would say. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe it's the fact that it's an iPod in a phone too, right? That's true. Because, yeah. I guess where I'm getting at is you can have a purple cow inside of a purple cow, inside of a purple cow. Yeah, you know, like an inception of purple cows. But then we're at, <laughs> we're, we're, at a, we're at a point now where the iPhone is very normal. It is. So what did the iPhone do? They have, I think, one of the best cameras in, in the um, in the industry, right? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure, but I think Huawei. Huawei is Huawei. now yeah. It's flow. What's the phone that just came out <laughs> that's got five cameras? Huawei. It looks ridiculous. There's five cameras on it. Is that the Samsung? Maybe I don't know. What is it? Right. Anyway, I think I think the evolution of camera phones could be a purple cow. Could, yeah, yeah. right? Because any new features? Yeah, a lot of people like to take pictures, and the cameras, you know, it's, it's a huge selling feature. Mm -hmm. They're they're interesting questions, and I think that reading this book, you know, throughout this month will allow us to like identify a bit more clearly, yeah. you know, what's why is this successful? Why yeah. is this not working? You know, or why did this work and stopped working at some point, right? Mm -hmm. and so I think it's important to know also that the purple cow doesn't have to be an object. It can also be something that you do, right? Does that makes sense. Like an yeah. idea, right? An idea. Yeah, exactly. Or something different that you do. Okay. It's a different service. Uh, yeah, added value to your service can be the purple cow, right? It's not just a, the iPhone itself. It I think be. Uber was a purple cow for. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A while, right? Yeah. Uber was a purple cow. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. And it wasn't a product, it was a service. Mm hmm And, uh, yeah. Even the likes of Skip the Dishes, uh, yeah. Uber Eats, that was, that was that's a purple yeah. cow. That revolutionized delivery. So would you say Lyft, which is also the same service, what's their purple cow? What's Lyft's purple cow? I don't know. Would you say it's the flashing lights they have on their dash? To identify which 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 ride is yours, something very different. I don't know if it qualifies them as if that qualifies as a purple cow. I mean, well, they're doing it, that's that's what they're doing differently. Yeah, I think. Right, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. that's the way you know that that's a lift, and yeah, you know, the Ubers have. The yeah, they have their own little signs. Yeah, I've never seen that in an Uber. 
I know you can flash your phone, but do they have the, anyways. Yeah. You can flash your phone? Yeah, so your phone, you, you have like a different color. Let's say you and I both call an Uber. Yeah. Uh, I can click on the flashlight thing on, on the Uber app and mine's green, yours will be red. They'll know which one to pick up. Yeah. Oh. But Lyft. Okay. The you sign just, changes yeah. color? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So I've only just started using Lyft, so I'm like finding out what it's about. Anyways. Okay. The gazillion. All this to say that, you know, to go back to what I was saying, the purple cow can be a little thing that you tweak. That's doesn't have to be, you, you, don't, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but tweak something that makes you stand out like a purple cow. Well, he talks about the elevator. Exactly. That, that new elevator that, yeah. that they created, because who are you marketing your elevator Dyson to, Dyson right? Krupp, is that the company? Uh, in the book? Anyways. So this book was written, what, 10 years ago? Right, yeah. And uh, it talks about this elevator idea and it sounds totally revolutionary but have you guys ever seen an elevator that asks you before you even get on which floor you want to go to no no i've never experienced that no. so maybe that's that was a purple cow that never caught on i don't know i'd like to what's it called i don't know i'm not sure yeah we'll have to find so, it. I, so the only name the only elevator company that i know that i know is Dyson Dyson Group, so I think that's the one they're talking about. Dyson, that'd be cool. Dyson elevator. It you up. Sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, How do you stop? <laughs> is that a purple cow? The Dyson. Yeah, that has been definitely. Purple. They 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 didn't reinvent the wheel. Well, I guess they sort of did with vacuums. They made vacuums cool. They innovated. You know? Yeah, I think their fan is a purple cow. The one yeah. that has no blades. Yeah. Right. Yes. How scared okay. were you the first time you stuck your hand in there? Not scared, but no. I was yeah. like, "There's, there's got to be something in there." <laughs> <laughs> like a blender, another dimension. <laughs> another dimension. <laughs> so that's one thing that this book does really well. It it does case studies. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it talked about the elevator. It also talks about Tide. Right. Yep. Tide Pod challenges. Yeah. Nintendo. Yeah. True. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, um, it's good that it talks about those different um, case studies. One of them was the Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah. Right? And are you looking for that elevator? Yes, company? Chandler Elevator. Yes, I never S even heard Schindler. about that. Huh. Chandler Elevator. That's way off. But you're right, I've never seen those. I but he know. talks about a certain area too, a certain building. Right? So he says... Well, it's, it has a three and a half star review. <laughs> I don't know if this is not. Control yeah. panel got wet, stop working. Schindler's elevators and escalators in Montreal. Okay. Mm. So it's still, yeah, it's an existing company for sure. I'm not sure how uh, successful it is. And, it, and mm. apparently it's from Montreal. We have, um, we have the luxury of time compared to this book. We're sort yeah. of like trying right. to see in the yeah. future. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, he says it really well here. Um, says you need to have a very good idea and you also need to be good at it and also to be lucky right so not every great idea will get that traction like mm -hmm. an uber did mm -hmm. right because it might be a fascinating idea but it, you need that luck of influencing a few of those early adopters yeah right and that's that's another thing we can talk about the bell curve mm -hmm. right. yeah. so um, you guys okay to talk about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he talks about this bell curve uh, as far as people adopting the product. So um, the first part of that bell curve is the early, 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 early adopters. adopters. Early adopters. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the that's the, the guy. Innovators. That's the guy that's fascinated with Apple products that will stay in the lineup outside of the Apple store. You know, camping out from 2 a.m. until yeah. open. Willing to pay the price to be the first ones to own it. So those are the early adopters. Do you have any any examples of people you know or maybe yourself? Yeah, like um, a local realtor here, uh, Jean Fichet. I was just going to say that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's a, like an Apple fanatic. He needs a new phone as soon as it comes out. Yeah, and that's his thing. Right. right. He's fascinated by that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, um, I think Nintendo has that... Um, yeah. Pull 
Yeah. I don't know if you guys have a company or a product that hmm. that you really get excited about when it, when it comes out. Well, when I was growing up, um, sorry, <coughs> we we're gonna say something. No, no, go ahead. Um, when I was growing up, I had to have the new Xbox every time. You know, that was my, that was our thing, my brother and me. We had to get the new Xbox. I grew out of it, of yeah. course. And I would say that now, today, knowing how much that costs, electronics. I, I love all the techie stuff, but um, I'm not. I'm never going to be the first one to buy them. Like I just got the Osmo. Um, what do you call that? You have one too. The Osmo. DJI Osmo. DJI Osmo for the phone, the gimbal. Right. Yeah. The selfie stick, if you will. Um, you know, I paid super cheap because I bought it like what four years after it came out. I'm not going to be the first ones to buy. Uh, the first one to buy something that's that's techy because it's too expensive. Yeah. yeah. So you're part of the early or late majority. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I think so. So what are the next um, segments of that bell curve? So innovators, early adopters, early late majority, which is the mass. That's what makes you. That's what. Yeah. That's the mass population, and then Correct. the laggards. Yeah. I don't think we got to the point where he was talking about the laggards yet. So a little bit. He did. A little bit, yeah. yeah. So here's here's my example. A friend of mine, you want to talk about laggards, so people that will buy something when it's a, when it's now a need because everything else is obsolete. Okay, yeah. Here's a good example. Our good friend, that's your Shoget. Yeah. He's the last guy I know that got a cell phone. He would use our cell phones <laughs> to make calls <laughs> or give out our phone numbers to his mom or girlfriend. Uh, to reach out to him because he said, well, you guys all have a cell phone. Why would I get one? <laughs> so so I guess it made sense until, until you know, we started wow. working and getting jobs and stuff like that, that you absolutely needed to get a phone. And I was like, okay, dude. But if you look at the phone he has now, I think he has like the iPhone 5 or 4. Right. You know, okay. like he'll, oh, still if it's to close phone. to being obsolete, this guy will have it. Pretty sure he still walks around with a goddamn Walkman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, um, the the bigger, the when, when it comes to, one of the things that he was talking about is how everything has changed yeah. from how they advertise those products, yeah. right? We still see iPhone ads on TV, but that's probably not the reason why we're buying an iPhone. Yeah. It's probably because your friend bought an iPhone. Like the word of mouth now is so much more intense than it was before. Before you have, a, like he was saying, you're an average product. You have money to put it on TV. People are going to buy it now. You have an average product with money to put it on TV is not enough to mm -hmm. get people to buy it because we have everything. It's true. Yeah. We have everything. Yeah. Like we have all of our needs already. It's just about, you know, going after that niche market that's going to promote your product through. Uh, word of mouth. Yeah. There's a quote he says in here somewhere, I should have wrote it down, promise I will next time, where he says there's a product for every need that we have. Right. So it's even harder for a new product uh, to pierce that market, to, to, to be able to, you know, land somewhere on our brains. Uh, I found that pretty interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You guys want to touch on um, the the decline of uh, traditional media? Yeah, so yeah, I, uh, I took advertising in college and, and uh, what I didn't realize at the time is that most of the stuff we were talking about was going to change in the next three, four years. So I graduated in 2006, uh, seven, sorry. Um, and since then it changed so much, it's crazy. So we, I remember this project where we had to come up with a new idea to reach our target audience or yeah, our... Uh, He's going to brag about this. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Oh, Go, about continue. Your, your, your college idea. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's just, it's, it goes to show you that it changed so much. So all the ideas we were having had, had something to do with television or print ad or um, the idea that we had came out the next year. So I'm, I'm not saying... No, no, listen, listen. So these, now we want to hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that'd uh, be good. Right in front of urinals, you have these little screens that have like still advertising that 
you know, switches after like 15, 20 seconds or 30, whatever. Um, that was our big idea. And if you look at today in every pubs, they have the, either these print uh, advertising or these screens. I, I don't think we see them as, as much as we did a couple of years ago, but. We do, for sure. Yeah, yeah okay. But um, those were cool when they came out, eh? Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like but we never happened. even touched on Facebook, YouTube. No. And we were talking about earlier, before you, you showed up, um, <coughs> Netflix. Right. There's no advertising on there yet. And for sure there will be advertising on it in the next couple of years. It just doesn't make sense for them not to do it. So I think there's subtle advertising in there. It yeah. has to be subtle or else people are going to get pissed off. Exactly. Like I think YouTube and, yeah. and Facebook are pissing me off. So the there's subtle advertising in the products that they use in those shows. Yeah. Like you see somebody using a MacBook or you see somebody drinking out of a Swell bottle. Of a yeah, but that's been around for ever, ever yeah. since movies have been around. Product placement. Yeah. But people are sitting on their TVs more than ever now. Yeah. Right? Your TV is in your pocket now, right? Um, but okay, I want to go back to what you were saying. That print advertising. Do you remember one ad while you were at the urinal looking at this print? Like, do you remember one ad that you saw in the past? Hmm. Or do you remember any ads that you see in magazines anymore? Like, no, not really. So, so does it? It doesn't work anymore. No, it's mm -hmm. all it's all video now, yeah. more than print for me, anyways. And social media. Yeah. And word of mouth. Yeah. So I wouldn't say TV is obsolete. It's just it changed. Mm -hmm. TV has a new meaning now. TV is your phone, your computer, uh, your TV, or your gaming system. How many advertising? Uh, it is more current events, yeah, and not you know pre-recorded shows. Yeah. Like, you know, so shows. they no longer advertise to the masses; they target. How often do you go on Facebook and you? They're trying to sell you something you just talked about. Like it's freaking insane. Like I mm -hmm. never thought that would have, that would have been possible. They're listening to you. I went to go take a look at shoes yesterday. My my brown dress shoes are cracked. Right. So I just went for fun. Swear to God, got home, opened my computer, Facebook, those same shoes were right there. It's it's like, they geo-marked your, um, yeah. your, your whereabouts in the mall. Yeah. Did you go to a mall or a box store? Box store. So that's even easier. Yeah, right? exactly. Wow. It's freaking nuts, man. It's, uh, they geo-marked it. Yeah, yeah, so your phone has a GPS in it. Right, yeah. And, um, you know, there's a few apps that ask to use your location even when you're not using the app. So they probably geotagged Chris inside of Best Buy shoes or whatever. Yeah. Rick's. Uh, Rick's shoes. No, I'm just kidding. Rick's. I don't, I don't know, know what that is. <laughs> it's a dirty store. That was just a bad joke. <laughs> it's a dirty store. We're sorry, Rick's. <laughs> <laughs> Does that even still exist? So uh, moving from TV, traditional media, to towards word of mouth, social media, I think the targeting aspect of, you know, hitting your clients with an ad once you know that they've been inside the shoe store and then you're like, oh, well, he's shopping for shoes, let's hit him. Mm -hmm. That is so much more optimal. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the companies are starting to realize that and now they're starting to, you know, put some money into social media. Yeah. Yeah. They're no longer fishing with a net. Yeah. Right? So they're, they're focusing on choosing the right bait for the right person they're no longer and they're creating yes. and i think that's where you're going with this sneezers yeah right we can talk about that yeah so towards the end of the uh 40 page that we read he starts talking about this idea called idea virus the idea virus yeah and uh, i think that it's a great analogy to talk about you know innovative marketing I wonder if he invented that that word I idea think virus that's pretty I think it was in another book. Oh yeah, right. He mentions it real quickly. Well, if you Google "idea virus," I think he's the first name that comes up. Yeah, probably made it. He might be a sneezer. He's a sneezer. Yeah, he might be the sneezer. <laughs> Don't be a sniffer. Be a sneezer. So the idea virus yeah. analogy is that you sort of implant uh, implant that idea into somebody's mind, you know, as a virus. Yeah, and then you need to reach out to sneezers to make it go So sneezers wider. are the ones that are going to take uh, your idea and, and uh, shift the word of mouth into another gear. Yeah. 
And it's, it's funny because we all often talk about in our business how sticking to basics always work. Word of mouth used to be the only way of promoting your business. And now here we are again, how many years later, word of mouth is now the way to go to push your business. Oh, but you just have to find those sneezers that are going to sneeze away the uh, idea virus. And are sneezers a word that could be interchanged with early adopters, or is that something different? Um, oh, good question. I think that you could be a early to late majority mm -hmm. and be a sneezer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're more likely to have sneezers in the group of the ultra early adopters, right? Mm -hmm because they're so passionate about that product. He also talks about the middle part of our bell curve here, early and late majority, being the, the bulk of the people you're reaching out to. Um, they won't believe the innovators and early adopters until it reaches them, right? Like they're, they won't believe you as, as uh, advertising, uh, like let's say you're pushing your, your product. They won't believe your, your ad until the innovators and early adopters have tried it out. Right. So maybe the sneezers that you want to reach out to are within the bulk of the people you're trying to reach out to. Early they're majority. less fanatic about that stuff. So yeah. in our line of work, I think the sneezers are our clients. Yeah. Probably, right? Mm -hmm. um, every person that uh, leaves you a Facebook review or a Google review, those are sneezers. Yeah. Those are the ones that will talk to you and uh, talk about you. Right? Yeah. Those are our sneers because all these ads that we promote, whether it's on Facebook, um, I don't think people will listen to them. I actually don't think uh, people pay attention to them that much, but they will pay attention to a colleague, they will pay attention to a friend, yes, they will pay attention to a past client, yeah, right. And that's and that was one of the biggest things about the idea of virus that he was talking about is that um, you know they listen to their experienced peers. But they're going to ignore you. Mm -hmm. Whew. Yeah. So unless you're somebody who represents any type of significance in their life, there's a good chance they'll just ignore you. Yeah, I think so. Um, and that's, I, I totally agree with this because if you're not, if you're not doing things differently, yeah, you're just like everybody else. Is Different. it safe to say that for um, certain products, the only way to reach your your niche market is to use people that have influence on, on the masses like athletes, pro athletes, is now more relevant than it has ever been? So we, see, we used to see that back, back in the day, right? Like they would use big stars to, to push their products. Yeah. But now it's even more targeted. I think it's skipping a step. Look, we just talked about the new youngest self-made billionaire, right? Like, what she is, is her using herself, uh, Kylie Jenner? With Kylie? Yeah. I thought you were talking about the Canadian, that, uh, the youngest Canadian guy, what's the one that created, um, uh, Wish, the Wish app, <laughs> the Wish app. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a Canadian. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Huh. That's that's crazy. A, is he Canadian? I th yes, he is Canadian for oh, sure. Yeah, yeah but the, it's the Wish app, or, or Wish app CEO. Huh. What's his huh? name? No idea. Uh, Peter. Peter. Just let it flow. Shishirsky. Shishirsky. Is that him? We're just a shire. Um, let me see. Uh, man, I feel like he is from Canada. Suzuki. Yeah. No, I think he was from Canada. Somebody else. He's a he's a blonde. He's about 31, 32 years old. Um, huh. So is Wish in any way That's him. a purple cow? I'm not too familiar with Wish, to be honest. That's him right there. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Good looking guy. 37, 37 years 1.4 billion Polish Canadian. 1.4 billion dollars. Ah, sick. But that's, I mean, Wish, that's not a, that's not a, how much of a, a that's an innovative app, right? But we had that before. We had Definitely. PGG. Well, I think. Similar to eBay. They're, they're more, um, like pushing online sales like uh, Amazon like, is. And new products, right? But is that what Wish is? Is it? I'm not it's sure. similar to like Alibaba in a sense. It's like I have no really cheap is. products. Okay. okay. I feel like from overseas, like gadgets China, and stuff like that? Clothing, everything. Oh, it's yeah. very, very cheap. Like I'm talking like you can get things for a dollar, two dollars. Quality's cheap too, but it's I'm really not familiar with Wish at all. 
I think I downloaded it once through a Facebook app. Okay. I think we're turning into sneezers for Wish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Next time. Hey. You know, and you, you talked about celebrity endorsements. Yeah. Um, there's this ad by the NFL. Uh, the they called it the 100th year game or something like that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but that yes. unless you you see it on Facebook, you see it shared by everybody on mm-hmm. Facebook because it was such a great ad, and it's your best athletes being funny, being humorous, at being the gala, people getting into a fight. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't yeah, yeah. you didn't see that going on NFL.com. You saw that on Facebook. I and saw it on during the Super Bowl. Yeah, so did I. yeah, probably. But it yeah. gained it gained extra legs online just yes. because it was such a good ad. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great ad. It probably it had different. more of a reach online than it did during the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. I think the Super Bowl wasn't even listened to that much this year. No, but uh, yeah. a lot of companies paid what? What was the most expensive ad on face on, on, on during the Super Bowl? Like I don't know. Thirty million, I think. For thirty seconds. I just remember seeing a big California tattoo. Yeah, pretty sad. The big California <laughs> tattoo. Yeah, it's just a, mar- a bad Maroon 5 joke. Oh. Yeah. Mm. I don't listen to that. Is that an Adam's stomach? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I have no idea what you guys are talking Isn't about. When he took off his shirt during the Super Bowl. Yeah, the oh, show. Yeah, right. the halftime okay. show yeah. was bad, and then he took off his shirt, and it was even worse. Like, <laughs> no! What was his name? They put on layers, man. Yeah. It's weird because they don't pay their performers, the NFL performers, for halftime shows. Like, but they get they get paid with endorsements though. Like all the money he made, he gave away to charity, which I find was pretty cool. I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know that. That yeah. speaks to how strong like the reach is. Like mm. artists are doing it just for, just for exposure. When's the last time you guys watched the Michael Jackson one? Uh, I still think it's the best just, one. Just a few weeks ago, because yeah. we were like, holy shit, this is bad. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. the Michael Jackson and one, and and uh, I started googling. Um, the, the best yeah. halftime shows and that was Michael Jackson. Prince, that was when you played Purple Rain and it was raining. Yeah. Like how freaking awesome is that? Oh yeah, that was cool. Jeez. Purple Anyways. Rain. He was playing Purple Rain. And it was raining. And it was raining. Oh no. And he just kept yeah. going and they were telling him like, watch out with your, your high top shoes, you're gonna fall. He's like, I don't care. It's like <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's how he talks. I don't care. It's a bad idea. Exposure, right? Yeah. So Eh? It's a bad or good they're getting exposure, right? Like the next day, Maroon 5 oh, yeah. streams went way up. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Just talking for sure. about them. So he said one thing here that uh, resonated with me. Don't try to create an idea or a product for everybody because that's a product for nobody. Yeah. Right? It goes back to we have everything already. Yeah. Like we, we have everything that we need. Unless you're, you know, you come up with something absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, but we have everything we need. And, yeah. um, you know, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, you can maybe try innovating it. Yeah. No, you can't use a shotgun anymore. You have to use a sniper rifle. Like you have to aim at yeah. your niche market a lot more. That's than, true. Yeah. And if, yeah. Because if, if they can they can become your sneezers. Mm-hmm. Find a niche. The market is small enough that a few sneezers can get you to the critical mass you need to create an idea virus. Yeah. Instead of starting big, start small. Yeah. Too often, like when I get business ideas, like I'm trying, I'm not like no, these people won't like it, and those. But like, let's face it, that product or that idea is not created for everybody. Right. Mm-hmm. It's for a very specific group of people, right? Exactly. Yeah. One hundred percent. With enough sneezers, your uh, product becomes cool, and then the mass will listen, right? That's you true. need the sneeze. Right. I think. Okay, am I allowed to talk about EXP here? Sure. I think EXP um, is a purple cow in the real estate industry. It is. Mm-hmm. Right? Definitely. They've, they've completely um, changed the way brokers or real estate brokers um, do their business now. Yeah. Right? They can have their own brokerage essentially. That was it's one of the first questions I asked him this morning. And I said, well, what's the purple cow in, in our business? And you said ownership. Mm-hmm. Everybody. Yeah. The more you perform, the more you own. But you can also look at your business, Rami. Um, you guys haven't reinvented the wheel yet. What you're advertising yourself as being, um, uh, you're, you're just advertising yourself as being different, right. yeah. and you're consistent with your ads. I've never seen that before. Uh, you and Brock Frost did it, yep. and I'm sure that's working out pretty good. So I think um, bro- mortgage brokers in general are now becoming what they were in the past, 
right? We were the, the problem solvers. Because if someone, like right now, most of the time it's a rate game, right? Who can get you the best interest rate? Mm -hmm. But there's more to a mortgage than that. But, but, but back in the day, people would come see mortgage brokers only when they can't get approved at the bank. Uh -huh. okay? Now we're more than that, of course. right? But now we're more than that plus with the um, amount of private money available to us we're also becoming more of what we were in the past. Yeah. So the past Problem is coming solvers. back. And that's what I think, you know, once those mortgage agents um, understand how the private, how private funds work, yeah. then they can become purple cows. Uh, so I think that's the purple cow in our business. Because I, I just don't, you know, even like something like the EXP in the mortgage business would be very interesting to see. Maybe it's a conversation we need to have. Maybe. Yeah. For sure. Cool. Uh, we have 160 pages left in this book, so yep. let's divide that by three. Sounds good. So let's say 60, 60, You're not and 40. The right guy. <laughs> do the calculation. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that works. So uh, if you guys um, enjoyed this and you want to sort of get involved in the conversation, read the next 60 pages of the book before you watch part two. Uh, this will be a four part series uh, for this book. And uh, if you enjoyed what you saw, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next Thursday. Not your typical book club. I like it. Yeah. It's good. It's pretty good. Yeah. You have to make shirts. T-shirts. Not your typical book club, yeah. yeah. I don't know. You got to cut it, Rahel. It's just going to 